Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ian Henderson. Uh, I'm currently chief executive of a small reg tech business called Kicker. We provide uh, KYC services to, to big banks, payments companies and other financial organisations. Uh, we've put together a, a stellar uh, team to discuss the, the big topic of the day, which is uh, banks and big banks and fintechs, uh, competition or uh, collaboration. So lots to, lots to talk about. Now, let me introdu introduce the speakers for today's session. Uh, first up, we will have Niels Peterson. He's a chartered accountant, senior lecturer at Manchester Metropolitan University and author author of Financial Technology, Case Studies in Fintech Innovation. Previously, he worked at PwC and also at the FSA and the PRA. Second up, we will have Simon Ecott. Simon heads up the payments product development and innovation for NatWest Group. He's also very well known across the payments sector, sitting on many influential payments bodies, including Pay.UK, the Participant Advisory Council, and the Bank of England's CHAPS Strategic Advisory Forum. Fliss started out as a professional musician, but wanted a job where she didn't have to worry about money. After retraining to become a corporate and commercial solicitor in private practice, she moved in-house as part of the senior management team at Faster Payments, the online and mobile banking scheme for the UK. She's now co-founded a fintech called Ordo, which is a payment platform offering a variety of open banking enabled payment solutions, making it easy to pay and to be paid. Fourthly, we have Srini Kasturi, He's a banking industry veteran with rich global experience. He's a payments leader at Barclays. He's also a fintech founder and patented inventor. And finally, we have Angela Yor. Angela is an entrepreneur, PR leader, and an influencer in the fintech sector. Since co-founding Sky Parlor in 2009, she's raised the profile of hundreds of brands uh, from dynamic startups to market leaders in the fintech, tech, and e-commerce sectors. So the format uh, for today is that each of the five uh, will give a five minute uh, summary presentation stating their views uh, on the topic, big banks and fintechs, competition or collaboration, uh, and they will pass sequentially to each other. And then at the end, we will open up again for Q&A. So I'd like to pass to Neil to kick off the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I have some slides to share. Uh, being a university lecturer, of course, I can't help but do a lecture. So uh, it'll be very. It'll, I'll try to stick within the five minutes. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen, uh, and I will present you with my views on what I think uh, the answer to the question is. So competition or collaboration. Uh, what I say today is based on my book. Um, so if you're interested, you know, I would recommend you read it. So uh, let's start with a background. Uh, as we have all seen, uh, whether it's food delivery, uh, retail, or even entertainment, uh, clearly things are becoming increasingly digitized. Uh, though what most of us may not realize, or certainly most consumers, is um, the rate of digitization behind the scenes. So with the application of technology such as blockchain, machine learning, uh, th that automation of digitization is happening to a far greater degree behind the scenes. Uh, we have younger consumers be be becoming more and more uh, shall we say, biased towards uh, solutions from big technology companies or mobile app developers and fintechs. And uh, that is chiefly because uh, we have what is what I would call a convenience culture. So because of people's experience with things like Uber, Netflix, Amazon, uh, consumers want things to go very fast and they want them to be easy and intuitive. And, and these expectations are spilling over into financial services. Now, uh, I, I would say that, that the good news for the banking sector is that very few fintechs are actually making any money. And because of that, uh, they actually need banks because banks, they have lots of money. Uh, and so uh, th there is, a, I would say, an opening for established financial institutions to collaborate with um, innovative startups uh, because they have a lot to offer. They, you know, in addition to funding, they can offer scale, access to customers, they can offer regulatory exp expertise, and uh, crucially, uh, brand familiarity. Uh, 
So, so people, you know, most people in the UK are familiar with, uh, you know, whether it be large banks or smaller building societies, that that uh, familiarity is a competitive edge. And so, where does this leave us? Well, given the uh, the recession and the pressure on margins that we see uh, throughout the economy, uh, I think the competitive imperative for banks will, will be to uh, apply technologies uh, to reduce costs, uh, but but do so in a way that. Uh, in a way in which they still leverage their ability to uh, do what technology companies can't. And, and that is uh, being able to engage consumers uh, with a personal touch. And, uh, you, you know, given the, their branch networks, try and be uh, present in local communities and engage uh, consumers locally. And I think that's very important because... Uh, one of the silver linings of the lockdowns is that local high streets are are becoming more reinvigorated, reinvigorated, and and people are engaging more with their local communities. So I, I think uh, certainly for for retail banks, being part of that, uh, whilst uh, collaborating with fintechs and integrating their different uh, and innovative technological solutions, doing those. Both things at the same time can uh, can, can give banks a, a competitive edge uh, and be able to thrive in the future, rather than just hang on and, and try to uh, you know fend off competition from uh, large technology companies. Uh, so, in conclusion, I think I think banks and fintech startups uh, have a lot to gain from uh, collaborating rather than competing. And uh, that's it for me. Okay, I think um, I think I'm up next. Niels, I don't know if you can take the slides down from the screen or not. Great, perfect. Thank you, um, and uh, and good afternoon, everybody, and, and many thanks for the opportunity uh, to speak today alongside a, a great diverse panel uh, on a subject that's very very close to to my heart. And as Ian said. In his introduction, I'm in the payments business with NatWest, and NatWest clearly fits into the uh, category of, uh, of a big bank, uh, as opposed to fintech in this uh, competition or, or collaboration debate. And to put that into a little bit of context, as a bank, uh, we support some 19 million customers, uh, which includes one in four of all businesses in the UK, and in my particular world, um, some 25% of all payments in some way, shape or form touch or go through, uh, go through NatWest. We also have connections through our open banking capability to, uh, to more than 200 different third parties, many of whom are, are indeed fintechs and that number is growing uh, all the time. So payments is a, is a hugely, biz, uh, hugely important business for us uh, and indeed the economy and fintechs to, uh, to Niels's point, you know, play a big part uh, in that whole ecosystem as well. The payments world is, is, uh, is clearly intrinsic to the, to the modern economy and it's undergone huge, huge change over the last sort of five to 10 years. And much of that is, uh, is, has been disruption and, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it, it's happened uh, with, the, uh, you know, with the input of, of many, many fintechs along the way and I believe is all the better for it. Um, and many, many, uh, many fintechs do operate. In fact, most uh, most of the fintechs, in some way, shape, or form, operate in the in the payments space, uh, and have fueled many of the uh, many of the innovations in customer service that we've seen today. So, just to emphasise a couple of points to, to to bring that into into real focus, every minute of every day, there's some seventy three thousand payments that go through, uh, you know, go through UK payment systems every minute. As I said. And every five days, the value of those payments makes up the entirety of the UK economy. So it's kind of important. But again, and there's some, some, some great themes in Niels's comments, people tend to take payments for granted. It's part of a bigger, broader experience. They just expect it to happen seamlessly, to happen instantly uh, and with limited friction. But most important of all, and this is a thing that does keep me awake at night, is it's got to be done safely. It's got to be done secure, securely. 
and has always got to be available and, and, and anybody who's you know who's been subjected to a, a glitch in their payment capability would pay their testimony to that so what does it all mean uh, in the context of the question payments payments is very much a network business we all rely on each other the end-to-end -end journey of a payment across the system uh, is uh, is highly complicated it goes through an ecosystem with with many many players it's also a business which is highly regulated indeed in the uk uh, we are probably unique around the world in terms of having our very own payment systems regulator uh, not a not a uh, you know not part of the sca uh, not necessarily different um, from the SCA and the PRA, but our very own regulator. It's driven by standards that are becoming increasingly interoperable. It's a rich, rich source of data that needs to be protected, but also used judiciously uh, for the benefit of the, uh, of the end customer as well. And increasingly, it's much more open uh, and without borders and more and more global systems are being you know, linked together uh, as, we, uh, as we go forward. That said, payments is also facing into even more disruption and from disruption comes more opportunities. So anybody that, that thinks the last few years has been busy in the payments world just needs to take a, a, you know, a quick look into, the, uh, you know, in, into the, um, uh, the future to know that that is gonna, just going to intensify. Now, fraud levels are, are rising exponentially, increasing global interoperability, as I said earlier. New technologies emerging all the time. You know, distributed ledger technology would be just one example of that. And customer expectations rising every single day. That bar is getting uh, ever higher in terms of what the customer uh, expects from, uh, you know, from, from its payment. Digital currencies are starting to become more than just a, a glint in the eye, whether that be central bank digital currency, whether it be stablecoin uh, or indeed cryptocurrency, uh, cryptocurrency wallets. So the whole nature uh, of payments is changing and innovating all the time. So to thrive uh, and survive in that uh, rapidly changing world does mean that we need to be adaptable and for me does, need, does mean we need to collaborate all the way across the industry, all the way across the ecosystem. And across that ecosystem there are many, many players, many of whom are, are new to the scene, many are more established, many fintechs within that, but to make the whole system work safely, securely, and seamlessly takes a lot of collaboration. So it's probably not, not a great surprise that, uh, you know, to the question of where do I stand on the competition and, and collaboration spectrum, it's very much pro-collaboration, which isn't to say that we shouldn't be competing, of course we should, but very pro-collaboration for many of the reasons that I outlined before. It's what gets me out of bed in the morning. It also keeps me awake at night as well if we're not collaborating well. This is very much a connected industry. Just a very, very small example in our own shop. You know, from the point at which a customer applies for a credit card until that credit card arrives on the physical doormat can go through up to 10 different, uh, 10 different firms and departments, many of whom are fintechs, just one small example. But if I raise that up to uh, the macro level and you look at the, uh, the clearing systems, it's not just desirable to collaborate, it's essential for the safety and security and risk management of those, of those payments. And just to put um, a final two, two spins on that, bad actors, I mentioned fraud er earlier, they will thrive in an environment where we don't have that tight knitted collaboration to make these systems work and work safely. But on the plus side, we will individually and collectively miss the opportunity to give our customers the very best payments experience if we don't collaborate. So that's uh, a bit of a whistle-stop tour on, uh, on, on Simon's, uh, Simon's view on the question. Uh, and I think I'm passing on now to Fliss. Hello, yes, thank you, Simon. So I'm Fliss, I'm a co-founder of a fintech, a fintech called Ordo. Ordo is an open banking enabled solutions platform and we can now provide payments as payments as a service. We've had software as a service and now we're providing payments as a service. I'll give you some examples of a few of our solutions to make it real for you and then I'll go on to the context in which we're providing those services today. So our top three solutions are a bill payment service and that comes in the form of, as the industry knows it, request for payment. And this is where business billers can send their customers their bills via a secure tokenized link one time use only to make sure it can't be reused or fraudulently passed on. 
and customers receive these tokenized secure links via email or SMS and notifications are in real time. Within three clicks, a customer kind of paid their bill and the money moves directly and immediately from the customer's bank account directly to the business's bank account. This could also be done by QR code. And this is useful over and above the payment methods that are widely and largely available today, for example, for utilities like direct debit, because of the differences we see in society and the way the differences people are working today, we shall come on to in a moment. Our other solutions are a face-to-face -face solution where a, say, market store trader, now that they're allowed to open up, can display a QR code instantly generated, bespoke for that transaction, rather than the market stall holder having to acquire lots of hardware to take card payments that they take ages to receive and cost them a lot of money. They can use Ordo and generate an instant QR code, which they simply display to their customer and they can be paid instantly. And finally, then there's the high flying e-commerce that has gone through the roof in the previous, the previous year we've just had and crisis is still ongoing. Ordo provides an e-commerce solution that any business can put into its uh, e-commerce journey on its website, either by us or white labeled. And this can be a pay now button or again, a QR code. So those are our solutions and the benefits above those other payment methods today are that it's quicker than taking card payments or using a payment processor. It's more um, flexible and gives the payer more control than signing up to a monthly direct debit, for example, and it's cheaper and lower cost and more secure all round. So what is the societal context we're in these days? Ordo did some research recently and we found that during the crisis, 80% of people gave themselves a financial MOT over lockdown um, and decided they were worried about money. 40% of those people plan to cancel a direct debit and half of those people won't be putting all those direct debits back once they've cancelled them. So I've gone through a few benefits of open banking enabled, enabled solutions over and above other payment methods that can be used today. How does Ordo deliver those? Is it competition or collaboration? So Ordo collaborates with an IT systems consultancy called CGI, and they help us provide our platform. And they're also a distributor for us amongst other companies. So that is a prime example of a collaboration with a business. We're also collaborating with an energy company, for example, PFP Energy, to help them with their now um, their bill payments, which are largely made out of call centers. And of course, no one's in a call center anymore for the moment. Everyone is distributed across the country in their own homes without the secure card detail taking network that they did have when everyone went into the same place. So that's another example of us as a FinTech collaborating across industry with a business directly to give them the solutions that help them face the challenges they have today. The call centre example means a operative of the energy company can be in the call centre on the phone to a customer. They can send that customer that needs to make increased ad hoc payments. Now we're in disarray over uh, surviving COVID and everyone's using more energy at home than we used to. They can talk the customer through making that payment. Um, in real time as they're taking each action and that's more helpful and more reliable that they'll get payment um, than hoping that they'll make a bank transfer or post in a check once the phone call is finished. We're also collaborating with Siemens, another energy case study, to create the fourth payment method as they're calling it. The fourth payment method, by, which is called managed credit, allows energy companies, the certainty and low cost of direct debit, but without the risk and upfront cost for the customer of prepayment. So using Ordo's open banking enabled solution as part of the payment in their energy solution called managed credit, we've been able to give all the certainty of direct debit without any of the cost of people being on prepayment meters. And that is only possible via collaboration again with a business directly with us and open banking payments. So you'll see, you'll notice that so far our collaborations are directly with businesses. 
And at the moment, and to provide our core services, we don't need banks, fintechs don't need banks. That's what PSD2, the Payment Services Directive brought in. And it's what the CMA mandate forced the nine biggest banks in the UK and more banks have joined have enabled us to hook up to 97% of the banking market and deliver these services in collaboration with businesses. That said, I think collaboration with banks will come because I don't think they can move with their legacy systems as quickly as fintechs can. So collaboration between bank and fintech will come as a force and as a result of competition. So my answer is collaboration horizontally across different sectors and types of business, forcing the banks competitively to collaborate. Now, if that's not sitting on the fence, I don't know what is. I'll pass over to Srini. Thanks, Fliss. Uh, and thanks everyone who's spoken before me. Uh, fascinating to listen. Um, uh, the, the topic is um, a duality. It offers a choice of collaboration or competition. And I don't believe it, it's a duality. I believe it is a continuum actually. Um, and that continuum is at the very least, fintechs are clients to banks, fintechs collaborate with banks and fintechs compete with banks. Um, and a fourth dimension to it is that a number of banks actually invest in fintechs and take shareholding and incubate them and make them um, ready for the world, for a grown up world of uh, redundancy, resilience, uh, regulatory compliance and, and a number of things that, that are um, the core strength of the bank as Niels mentioned, but equally required by the FinTech. So um, there's, there's a whole continuum that, that, that these relationships exist in. And I'm gonna draw on a few um, personal experiences and case studies to, to demonstrate why the spectrum is important and it is not a duality. The duality suggests that innovation only comes from FinTechs and not from banks. But uh, that's a very recent view, and it's a very um, it's a it's a very uh, buzzword based view of a fintech. And a fintech is basically um, a technology company that participates in flows and touches uh, the transactions, um, as opposed to um, previous uh, iterations of technology companies that provided kits to banks. Um, so some of the processing and some of the workflow has moved to fintechs, and they they offer unique value um, that is um, that is targeted at a, at very specific use cases and client segments that banks have traditionally not done. Um, meanwhile, banks have um, driven a number of innovations in the past uh, and continue to do so. Um, I work with Barclays and I take a lot of pride in the innovations that Barclays brings to the market. Um, if, we, if we go back uh, uh, to, to you know, some of the key milestones, the digitization of banking uh, was obviously driven by the banks over, over the last few decades. And uh, uh, the innovations like mobile payments, Barclays paying it, for example, or even open banking that enables uh, some of these fintechs to, to thrive um, are offerings of banks. Um, the, I, I, there are so many models that banks work with fintechs on. I remember uh, as a cub into banking in the late 90s being deputed into a, uh, a venture cap backed fintech um, from my bank to help incubate it and nurture it and, and launch it and hand it over to a fintech um, workforce that could run it without the bank's umbrella on it. Um, so that was ages ago where, where the bank consciously created value in a fintech by investing in it and then putting resources in it to, to, to build it up and then let it loose on the world to create value for shareholders. Um, I've also been uh, fortunate to have launched direct banks in, in two countries, uh, the UK being one of them for, for that bank, uh, a US bank. Uh, so I've seen a lot of entrepreneurship that sits adjunct to core banking being driven by banks. Um, but really the most interesting thing comes when the FinTech uh, ecosystem begins to develop and, and a lot of uh, value segments can be addressed uh, even though they might be subscale or, or niche for a bank to address, the fintechs can take it as a monoline focus. And, and as Neil said, some of them might not make money, but they will have tremendous focus in solving that pro problem. And that will lead to all kinds of other successes and eventually money. So, so it's really important for fintechs to, 
to do that and for banks to enable fintechs to do that. So Barclays is, is, is a big uh, supporter of fintechs and uh, we serve a number of fintechs as clients. Some of the largest fintech names and neobanks that you, you hear about um, would be associated with us in their flows in some manner or the other where we enable them um, access. Uh, the, 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 so that's, that's the collaborator space and, and or the client space. Collaboration, in, it, it implies co-creation. And I wanna talk about an example of co-creation. Uh, Form3 is a company that is a, a, a cloud native payments provider um, and uh, Barclays has a shareholding in Form3, but we also are a client of Form3 and therefore Form3 is a vendor to us, which means collaboration and, and, and co-creation. So that co-creation results in us being able to offer SEPA instant uh, in Europe using Form 3's infrastructure for other fintechs like eBury, for example, to have access to SEPA directly um, uh, using the Form 3 kit to connect and become, um, and, and to be able to be addressable on the SEPA clearing. So that's co-creation and that's hugely valuable and it, it creates a fintech ecosystem of its own uh, with new value. So that's, that's definitely important. Um, I'll take another example of um, Alipay. Uh, Barclay Card uh, merchant acquiring uh, accepts Alipay across uh, nearly 400,000 merchants in the UK. And that's an extension of the merchant's value proposition to their customers, to both the native Chinese population, as well as when the economy opens up, all the travelers that come in. So there's, there's a lot of value. And, and Neil summarized it in that, in that slide, which says, what do banks bring to fintechs? And that's scale, that's recognition, that's uh, the client base. Um, there's the rigor and all of that that comes in, which allows for co-creation and collaboration in a very robust manner, um, in, in a way that scales to be of benefit to the entire economy. Um, I have another example of uh, enabling um, fintechs. If you consider Western Union a fintech, um, which it rapidly is becoming. And this is the interesting thing when you look at large firms that have traditionally uh, been in monoline businesses, they have started to pivot into fintechs and explore new value segments um, using technology. Um, and and uh, we offer, uh, we worked with Western Union to create a unique solution in India, which has a trap currency, allowing parents to pay for their kids' education overseas using an outward remittance, which is a regulated flow. So we help them with all the regulations around it and they offer the distribution for parents to actually make that payment overseas. So um, similarly, we partner with, uh, on the trade and uh, trade side uh, with the debt distribution platforms. We partner with receivables financing platforms that all bring value to corporate clients. And, and these are platforms that are ecosystems in themselves. That's the great value some of these fintechs can bring by sitting outside banks. They create their own ecosystems, which create scale and unique value. So, um, yeah, so I, I think, you know, to, to summarize, it's, it's, a, it's a large continuum of, you know, shareholding, client, competitor, collaborator, co-creator, and all of this needs to happen. The most important thing is for the competition to be there. I think, you know, there are a number of underserved segments. There are unbanked populations around the world that fintechs are beginning to address, and some have addressed very well, like M-Pesa in Africa. Those are essential for, for society to, to evolve to the next level, um, to, to bring inclusion into, into uh, the financial services. And uh, that's why, um, you know, banks, as much as we would view some aspects of fintechs as competition, they are absolutely essential for creating that value in the economy. And with that, that, that that's basically where I said, it's not a fence. If it is, it's, it's a very broad fence and I'm very comfortable sitting on it. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Angela. Well, how do you follow that? Thank, thank you, everybody. Um, so I think I'll, I'll just start. Ha hello, everybody. My name is Angela Yor. Um, I'm the managing director and founder of Sky Parlor. That's a FinTech um, public relations uh, consultancy. Um, so I work with a lot of FinTechs, but the FinTechs that I work with work with a lot of banks. And I also, I'm um, on the advisory board of the Emerging Payments Association. And on that advisory board, there's 17 different people. 
And um, the EPA is represented by 150, we, re we represent 150 members. And that's a mixture of both big banks, big techs, uh, big consultancy and law firms, and also um, the fintechs. So the fintechs uh, and the banks are already hugely collaborating. Um, and, you know, just through all the examples that, that the other um, uh, participants have, have given and have been for many, many years, because there's always been tech in fin um, f through to the very first payments transaction back in the 1950s with Diners Club, I guess, it, it, and, and also payments, the payments rails, that's, that's all technology that run, runs it. So, you know, fintech and, um, and, and banks, 100% collaborate. So, you know, but competition, um, I think we need competition. And, and I think we found we needed competition, um, especially where, you know, with the financial crash, because we've always really, you know, as consumers, I'm speaking now, uh, have, you know, fully trusted our, our banks as basically the fourth utility. And, and, and during that, that period, the banks, you know, let us down. And it was at that point that I think gov world governments recognise that we did need to you know, create more open competition. And, and, and as a result of that, we've seen all these fintechs, incubators sort of coming through, which is absolutely wonderful to see. Um, so, you know, we always want competition, but we also want collaboration. And it, on many, you know, in, in many examples, I think that the, the banks, you know, you know, they're not really at the minute that they still hold the customer relationships, you know, by far, you know, they're not that, they're, 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 you know, there's there's no big fear that the that the fintechs are going to take the market from the banks right now. Who knows what might happen in the future? Um, so, again, very good reasons why, um, you know, that, that both, you know, both apply. I think the other speakers have said that as well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, of course, you know, that there is some frenemies out there. Um, and again, you know, if that perpetuates more competition, then great. Um, and to join the, the gang between the banks and also the, um, fintechs, you know, we have to, you know, put up there the big techs as well, because our, 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 our children and our teenagers and our young adults, you know, they want one touch point, they're digital natives. And, um, you know, they, they, this, this is giving rise in many countries to the super apps, the WeChats, the social media sites uh, and apps on our phones. We all bank, you know, 80% of us now bank on our phones. And certainly in that age group, it's even higher. And, you know, we want to be able to make payments. We want to get paid and we want to um, pay and we want to do our banking all from one single point of integration. And the super apps, you know, give rise to that. And they're kind of taking us left field. You know, they're not, they're not necessarily banks or the fintechs, uh, but they're embedding banking technology in, within their, um, uh, you know, with, within, within their systems. Um, so, you know, and, and bringing, you know, we're talking about collaboration and we're also talking uh, um, about competition. I want to bring in an, another adjective to that, which is openness. And openness is, is not only, um, you know, about open platforms and open APIs, but it's also about open banking and, and also openness in terms of, you know, putting the customer at the heart of, of, of what, you know, the banks and, 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 and the fintechs are doing. And the wonderful thing about open banking is, is, is you know, all of a sudden we have these amazing um, banking solutions, which enable us to talk directly to niche groups. So our customers are starting to get products that really suit their needs. And, um, you know, a couple of the other speakers have, have spoken about, um, you know, um, M-Pesa and uh, they've, they've, spo they've spoken about um, financial inclusion. Um, and, you know, the, the ability for the, for the banks and the fintechs to work together, th this also helps, um, you know, us create more financial inclusion. And it's a huge problem. It's a, a huge gut problem worldwide that needs solving, but it is being solved and it's being solved by the collaboration between fintechs, banks, and also I'll bring into the fore there, the telecommunication companies as well, um, you know, who are also helping to solve the problem of financial inclusion, giving people a mechanism on their phone to pay. 
Um, but what's against the fintechs? Scale, um, uh, legislation um, as well, uh, you know, because ultimately, you know, the, the, the banks, we know, you know, we're, we've got that vault hole of, of the safety of having our money within the banks. You know, we don't quite have that yet with the legislation um, from the FCA um, around uh, fintech payments and fintech banking solutions. So there's work to be done there with reg regulation. And also infrastructure is, is a big barrier to entry um, for the fintechs. But then, you know, the fintechs with, uh, with, with scale, um, Square, for example, they've just applied for a, bike, a banking license. So here's where we start to see, you know, something that might be a little bit of a threat to, to the bigger banks worldwide as well. Um, so, and, you know, there's, there's no secret to say that although the banks have, uh, you know, are, are full of innovation and full of great uh, financial technology, there's no doubt that, you know, the, the banks have legacy systems that they, they, they're, you know, moving towards the cloud and there's all sorts of issues with the cloud and security, you know, in banking. Um, and, and the banks have struggled and have been slow to um, adapt to customer uh, needs. But, you know, they're managing to overcome that by their acquisition strategies um, and their partnerships. So never before has collaboration um, been needed. But, but also that one of the cons for the fintechs is, of course, consumer awareness. Consumer awareness is still slow. And, we you know, we, we also are slow to change our banking behavior. You know, all you've got to do is, is look at myself as a good example. I've still got the first bank account that I ever set up at 16, which is with NatWest. I worked for NatWest when I was 16. And also um, my parents banked with NatWest. So, you know, but I don't think that the, um, the alpha generation and the generation Z have those allegiances or loyalties. But, you know, the, the CAS system, which is the current account switching service, you know, it's still a, a struggle, to, you know, and there's been adverts all over the TV, you know, above the line, below the line activity. It's still slow to get, get people to change, you know, to their trusted bank. But there's been a study done by McKinsey and they've looked at um, the, the sort of fintech world and the adoption by consumers. And they're starting to see that the, the results of the survey said that the fintechs are catching up with traditional banks in terms of consumer trust. And also that in the southern states in the US, um, there are fintech strongholds, both in terms of overall fintech accounts and also growth since the start of the crisis. I think somebody else also mentioned that that acceleration of pace at the beginning of the crisis really um, you know, has been great for financial technology and the digitization of life. And so I think, um, you know, I'd like to pass back to our chair and, um, you know, I, I would say I'm on the fence quite happily as well. Okay, so hopefully not too many splinters in people's backsides with all this fence sitting that's going on, but uh, <laughs> we, we, we posed a very simple question at the beginning, you know, collaboration or competition, and you've heard a number of very nuanced answers there, which I think the answer is in reality, it's both, it's a spectrum, as, as, Shirini, as Shirini said. Uh, we've a number of questions coming in. Can I remind participants, please use the, the, the Q&A uh, panels on, on your screens to, to drop additional questions to us. Uh, a pretty stark one to start with, uh, you know, the, the death of banking has frequently been foretold. Uh, will it be fintech that will lead, lead to the end of, of banks as we know it? Uh, like each of the participants to, uh, to, to, to give us their view uh, on, on that question. I'll maybe kick off with the, the reps of the big banks, those who've got everything to fear clearly, uh, Simon and then Shrini, and then we'll open it up to the others. Simon first, please. Yeah, thanks, Ian. And, and yeah, great, great question. Um, and uh, there's, there's no doubt that the, you know, that the the developments over the last few years, and indeed sped up by the pandemic, um, you know, have, have caused big banks to up their game a lot in uh, in, in many different spaces. But the short, the short answer is no. I don't I don't believe that uh, uh, that will be the case. I think the industry has definitely moved on from the adversarial position that was taken. Uh, maybe uh, you know, maybe a few years ago, <clears throat> and, I, and as, as I said in my intro, particularly in the in the payments world, which underpins everything that we've been saying, you know, it is very much a networked industry, and we need positive collaboration to survive. I think banks have have adopted many of the um, you know many of the approaches of the fintechs that they, they've changed. You know, Srini talked about stuff that Barclays are doing. We you know we're doing similar. We've got a lot of partnerships with 
you know, with with um, you know with fintechs. You know, great example in the fraud space. We work with a company called uh, um, called SurePay to develop our confirmation of payee service, and many many more examples like that. So, and I, if I go back to Niels's Niels's point, there's a lot that uh, you know that, that the big banks provide throughout the entirety of this. You know, whether it's capital, whether it's customer base, but but we've got to change. We've got to change, and we are changing. Uh, and, and I did like the uh, the continuum analogy that Sweeney brought. Can I pass to Shreen to give another uh, I guess big big bank big bank perspective, and then we'll we'll uh, let the others have their uh, their cup and spoil. Uh, uh, th thanks, thanks, and and uh, Ian, and I agree with uh, Simon. Uh, I I really don't think this is one or the other, and this is not a choice to be made. Uh, fintechs are very nuanced, and that that broad brushed it word of fintech fails to um, describe the complexity, the richness and and the targeted nature of many fintechs. Um, that that is uh, that is that is the core of the fintech spirit that keeps that innovation going. And uh, banks are have to be many things to many segments. And that is um, difficult to do at pace and at at, at scale, um, which is why the fintechs exist to fill those gaps and 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 do the things um, that that some subscale or or thus far neglected client segments might ask for. So definitely, um, I don't see fintechs replacing banks or banks killing fintechs. I think that there's a coexistence to be had here. There's a lot of technology enablement by fintechs to banks. There's a lot of banking enablement by banks into fintechs. And, and that's uh, going to be a great way forward to, to see a very rich ecosystem of financial services develop. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Thank you, Srini. So I'd, I'd like to ask Phyllis first and then Angela to give the, the case from the, the, the FinTech perspective and then maybe get Niels to, to draw, uh, draw together uh, from an academic perspective. Thanks, Ian. Um, as the fintech, uh, I find myself agreeing with the previous two speakers, and no, I don't think fintechs will lead to the end of the banks. Um, as Angela was saying, people are very reluctant to change bank account, and there is there are generations that are more reluctant to use other services other than their banks for certain things, and, and this includes then we extend out to things like mortgages and loans and the like. What I think will happen, though, is that the bank's use and service scope will diminish. And I think fintechs may take over more services that the banks currently provide. And as younger people uh, grow up and get control of their own money and start using more and more services, I think those younger generations will want more services provided from fintechs rather than a bank just because I think fintechs are able to do things quicker with new technology and they have a knack for creating, as Angela said, customer-centered services that really think about the customer first and even to the extent of how does the customer want to see this? What do they want to see on their phone screen? And it absolutely will be a phone screen and not a laptop and definitely not going into a branch. And even for the more heavy duty core services that banks provide like loans and mortgages for example that I think they will still provide for the foreseeable future. There are however those interconnected services like Swoop now will find a bank that will give you a loan for you and is extremely popular and there are services that find you where you can build up your credit rating to get a credit card and then which credit card you can buy. So whilst I think the banks still have a role to play because people are very reluctant to change, um, I think people trust the banks, but they don't like the banks. Whilst their, their services will diminish, and even then, whilst they still have a role to play, there are fintechs along the way that carry out services to enable consumers to consume the bank's services. That's my view. Thanks, Liz. Angela? I think you're on mute, Angela. Hi, I'm here. Got a bit nervous there and couldn't get off mute. So um, I was going to just uh, pick up on a point there that Fliss made, which is actually there is segments of the population that still are not quite served by the bank. So it's quite important really that 
the fintechs help to you know to fill that gap and one of that you know especially with so many people are globally now you know losing their their jobs being on furlough at the end of september we're just about to come out of furlough um and you know what might happen then um and we need affordable credit but the, the banks you know are a bit risk adverse because you know quite clearly they're businesses and you know they don't want to take you know the, the risk of of not getting the money back uh the loans uh back so you know i think it's a great thing that we had um open banking and uh also um you know this this opening up of the sector we it was desperately needed and and i still don't think that open banking has fully you know helped with with creating and perpetuating the competition enough because consumers still are you know not switching you know as, fa as fast for, for products that would be better for them um and you know I think that, that the bank should be worried um, uh, about uh, competition because, you know, Revolut's, you know, gaining great scale as a fintech um, and also um, Square has just applied for a banking license. So, you know, I think it's the companies that have the scale that are the company like the apples and the, and the companies that have the scale that are moving into this space are probably the ones that that the banks, uh, you know, the fintechs that you know the bank should be looking at and looking out for at, at um because they are not the ones that they can gobble up that easily um if anything it might be the other way um around and the other thing is as well in terms of brands and lifestyles you know our, our consumers of the futures want everything to be an experience whether it be gamification whether it be you know aligned to their uh, lifestyle choices, cultural choices, and and the banks are doing a, a great deal to you know to uh, with you know many of the great campaigns, um, the Digital Eagles campaign at Barclays and others, you know to, to to you know kind of bridge that gap. But I still believe that there is a cultural gap between the banks and the consumers of the future, which the banks will need to you know to have to uh, move towards. And, um, you know, I think it all sort of circles back to the opening up of life. And, you know, if you look at a number of the banks, I mean, they have thousands of employees from all walks of life, all diversities. So they have the, um, you know, the, the scale and the, and the talent and, uh, you know, to be able to make those pivots because they're a true representation of society. Um, whereas the fintechs at the minute, I, I guess many are still, you know, for sort of that millennial sort of young uh, group that, but, you know, there's there's many more demographics to serve, which the, the, the banks are doing very, very well. Thanks, Angela. N Niels, do you want to try and just draw the different strands together and, uh, and, and point to a conclusion? Okay, well, well, I mean, I, I would say um, that... Uh, Financial services have existed for a very long time, so since ancient times, and and as long as you know, there there's what is in economics called the lemons problem that uh, financial institutions they fulfil an intermediation role, but because they're able to help, uh, let, let's say, the depositors diversify, that 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 problem hasn't changed, but because it, it's it's a uh, fundamentally a sociological slash economic problem. So, so I think, frankly, banks are, are going to adapt. Uh, yes, there, there will some new fintechs that are very successful will emerge as, as mainstream financial institutions. Uh, but but I, I, don't, I, I don't like to think in binary terms. So, so it's either, you know, it'll be the death of banks or it'll be, be it'll not be i think it'll change the financial services sector but but you know change is is, is a fact of life that that's always been the case finance has changed since the 80s right or since the 90s and we're so what we're really witnessing is just an acceleration of change uh, and yeah that's it that's a really good point uh, acceleration of change and obviously time is accelerating as well because we've only got 10 minutes left and there's loads of questions so what i'm going to do now is, is maybe just direct one or two to answer uh, some of the questions that are coming up so there have been a few questions around uh, the theme of open banking and whether open banking will finally achieve global acceptability uh, due in part to to the crisis and i'll ask simon and fliss to to, re to respond to this maybe starting off with simon yeah, thanks, Ian. Very, very broad question, so I'll, I'll keep it 
kind of succinct. So like some one of, one of the panelists said earlier that, that, that open banking was mandated. That's absolutely correct. We were one of the CMA nine. And my, my own personal view on this is whilst maybe at the time it was seen as a way and, and a bit of a threat for the banks, actually we viewed it very differently. Um, we've seen it as an opportunity to build a lot of those partnerships. I you know, mentioned the number of, uh, of third parties that we, we deal with. The propositions are starting to come through. The use cases are very strong, um, both developed by ourselves as banks and, and also uh, as, as sort of providers of payment services or account, uh, you know, account information services. The volumes are still relatively, in relative terms, low, but the, the, the rate of growth is, is exponential. And I think the key question is, where does it go next? So I think, you know, it, it's off and running, totally supportive of it, and it will lead to better customer experience but it needs to then move on to the next phases of open finance maybe moving into pensions dashboards and the like so yeah it will absolutely be part of that acceleration in my view thanks simon and Fliss, do you want to give uh, give your perspective please sure yes um, yes, I think it will eventually. I, Angela mentioned earlier that consumer awareness of open banking is low at the moment, and I would agree with that. That's our challenge to get people to adopt a new financial technology. And what are generally people nervous about in life? They're nervous about finances and tech. So <laughs> we've got our work cut out for work cut out for ourselves. But Here's why I think it will be accepted globally eventually. It is the five benefits that open banking brings and you can't get away from them. And they are, we are lower cost than the card rails. Uh, so that will save businesses money and in turn save consumers money. The payments go directly into the business's bank account correctly, fully referenced first time. So businesses don't have to spend currently the nearly 10 hours a week small business owners spend on reconciling accounts. Um, the customer experience is much better within a few clicks of our service, literally three clicks, they can have paid a bill directly from their bank account to the business's bank account. So it's a better customer experience. They have a notification of their bill on their phone, which they're always walking around with, and they're not always walking around with their gas bill ready to pay when it comes through. The money is sent to the business immediately. There's no money hanging around with maybe PayPal or Stripe or sum up for the five to seven working days. It takes payment processes in the middle to transfer the money to the business. So that improves liquidity and cash flow. And finally, it's more secure um, by sending out invoices across our platform, for example, rather than um, people sending out e email invoices where fraudsters have algorithms that hack into uh, emails and look out for emails that contain payment request, invoice, those sorts of words. They hack into them and change the account details to their own. So across a broad spectrum of how businesses use payments and how their customers and clients have to pay, open banking has improvements on the problems that people don't know they have today. So once that is realised and then it will be trusted, then I think open banking will take make a storm. Thank, thank you, Fliss. Uh, this next question I'd like to direct to Srini, if, if that's okay. Uh, how does the panel view the approaches of Starling Bank and Monzo? Uh, they've built their own IT infrastructures, but are fully licensed banks. Would they class them or would you, Srini, class them as a fintech? I, I think, you know, this, this is an interesting one because uh, Angela mentioned a couple of uh, uh, fintechs that are applying for bank licenses. And this is where, you know, the question becomes impossible to answer on whether banks will survive or fintechs will survive because a lot of these fintechs that scale and get those bank licenses are actually becoming banks. So um, I think um, th there's, there's, there's something in the spirit of a fintech that every bank wants to have. And the names you mentioned, Starling and Monzo, certainly bring that spirit into banking, right? Which is about doing things fast and focusing on a client experience and a consumer experience that is seamless. Um, banking is is not a chore. Banking is not your is not what you get out of bed for unless you're a banker. Uh, that's not what you get out of bed for. And therefore it just needs to be dealt with as many of the utilities in life and not, not central um, and, and demanding attention in itself. And, and uh, while a lot of uh, the banks focus on the client experience and the customer experience, they, um, there are uh, 
there's technology acceleration that's brought about by the new players in this field that also creates new benchmarks for all of us to aspire to, to love, learn from, and equally, you know, to, to give back also, uh, because um, a lot of what these banks do is to be at least as good as the existing banks. Um, so there's, there's, there's a virtuous cycle in which at the end of the day, the customer and the client should benefit. And the terminology that goes into these buckets might be really fuzzy a few years on. Thank you, Srini. Uh, the next one up I was going to ask was, uh, where is it? Yeah, maybe it's direct this one to Niels. How, how does a, a fintech start? How does the fintech startup, startup approach big banks about a collaboration while they try to protect themselves from a potentially competitive predator? Well, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I, I would def defer my answer to uh, uh, either Fliss, who is involved in a startup, or, or some of the bankers on the panel. So uh, that, that, that's 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 my answer. Okay, I, I was I, I was deliberately choosing you to try and avoid uh, putting oh, these folks on the, right. on the spot, but you've now, you've now <laughs> okay, put them on the spot. Enough. So look, uh, let's ask Simon to respond uh, as one of these big uh, ugly predators. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been described as a big ugly predator. You know, I, I, I shall have to think about that one. Um, but no, thanks. I mean, the, 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 the short answer is talk, talk to us in the first stage. And, and, and secondly, if you look at what ourselves and indeed you know, uh, others, others have done in terms of building our incubation hubs, building our entrepreneurial hubs, working very, very closely on the ground, using our offices, providing support to, to fintechs, I think that probably is evidence that what we're trying to do is work with the community, work with fintechs, work with, you know, work with startups and, uh, and, and entrepreneurs to develop their business rather than, uh, uh, rather than trying to suppress them. Th thank you, Simon. Uh, this will probably need to be our last or possibly second last uh, question. Uh, would this collaborative approach referenced by the big bank reps have occurred as quickly without the various regulations which you've seen in the UK and in other territories, for example, open banking? So it comes back to the open banking question here, but I think the, the core to the question is, you know, would you have done it by yourselves without a degree of regulatory pressure? And I guess that's got to go to uh, Shrini first and then Simon. Okay, this is a fun question because it's designed to be provocative. Um, and. Uh, um, I would I would say uh, yes, we would have done it anyway, and we were doing it anyway. I, I gave you an example from the '90s when I set up a, 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 fin, a fintech. Um, some of our shareholding in our fintechs goes back a long way, from before um, the uh, regulations came into force. If you look at um, um, fintechs as clients, if you take some of the big payment names that we've talked about, they predate these regulations in open banking, and they have been supported and incubated by banks, um, not just from a capital perspective, but also from a, uh, a processing and uh, uh, infrastructure perspective. Um, the banks are the best endpoints into regulation, into KYC, and into um, um, uh, scheme access. So that, in that sense, uh, there's, there's a lot that banks have already done to create this whole buzz about fintechs and then create the urgency around the change in regulation uh, that wouldn't have happened if banks had sat back or tried to be predatory towards fintechs. Thanks, Shrini. And the last word to Simon. Yeah, yeah I agree, agree with that. I mean, re regulation is, is, a, is a topical, or, you know, all of itself and, and the, you know, open banking specifically with the CMA9 uh, you know, approach was, was, was quite specific. Um, regulation needs to be good regulation and targeted. And the way that I look at it is it needs to be used to develop that proposition to be able to uh, address customer pain points. And, and there's no doubt that the CMA order did speed up the, the access point. Uh, and I think as a result, certainly for my own institution, we've taken that run with it and embraced it as a as a real positive um you know Srini's point about it happening before that absolutely but specifically on open banking i think it was a good you know a, a good nudge in the direction which we were traveling in terms of opening up but uh, maybe sped it up a little bit 
Perfect. Thank you, Simon. Well, we are, we are timed out, folks, unfortunately. Now, there are a number of unanswered questions. Uh, I will work with Emma and the panellists to, to get those questions uh, answered in the form of a written response. So that will happen uh, relatively relatively soon. Uh, without further ado, it really just leaves me to, to thank uh, today's panellists for taking the time, uh, for giving us their insight and actually for, for generating a very stimulating uh, conversation. So can I thank Neil, Simon, Fliss, Angela uh, and Srini for their input. Thank you all very much. I hope we've enjoyed the session. Feedback always uh, welcome, but we will come back to you with answers to your uh, unanswered questions. Thank you, everyone.